Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, drumming entrepreneur Jimmy Pemberton. And now, Rich Redman. So, Jim. Yes. Can you tell how excited I am right now? I, you know, your level of excitement is always uh, quite high. I mean, ear to ear. That's right. Excitement, right? Yes. And look at this open window I have in front of me. I could just, just jump out. What do you know, think? How's the, the lighting? You guys there. like this? Is, is this good? You know, I like it. I got my little ring this light. Thing. Man, like all the crazy kids. So Jim, let's 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 just get into this man because longtime friend of mine, killer drummer, and when we talk about cereal, now we're talking and we're not talking about basic four life count chocolate. We're talking about a cereal entrepreneur. My friend Jimmy Pemberton. Yeah. What's up, Hello, buddy? What's up, man? Thanks for having me, guys. Dude, I know that apartment. I've been in it. You have. You have been here. <laughs> How's the weather? How's the weather? And now you're outside of Boston. Right. Yeah, I'm like, uh, I don't know, 10 minutes south. I'm in Quincy. Quincy? And there's there. like seven Dunkin' Donuts on every street corner. Yes, and the original one is actually here, oddly enough. Really? Yeah. You know what's funny? I don't really go, but... In, in that part of the country, they actually taste better than all the other Dunkin' Donuts in the country. I would bet. That would be my as bet. Far as the coffee or the donuts? The donuts. Yeah. Jim's what? like, Jim's like, I eat donuts. Definitely donuts. I haven't had a donut in a while, but I love donuts. You got to put them in the microwave, though. I think that's the secret. Really? Yes, hundred percent. I dip mine in my coffee. I actually dunk the donut in the coffee. It's got to be got to be plain old fashioned. You do it, yeah. You mm. do it the original way. That's awesome. Like a glazed donut, Jim. Nope, plain old fashioned donut. And plain, oh. oh. A plain, so basically it's just like a muffin or a piece of cake without frosting. It's a cake donut, right. I like a cake donut, but I got to have a blueberry, chocolate, coconut, something. Some, some pizzazz. <laughs> so Jimmy, tell us all about, remind me in my pea-sized brain, my little T-Rex brain <laughs> that is going, it's getting worse and worse because the Alzheimer's does run in my family. Just ask Jim, just ask Sarah. <laughs> um, we met 10 years ago, right? Yes. So this is actually a story that I love telling just because the story is so bizarre. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, set, I'll set the whole thing for you. So it was, I want to say like a Friday and I'm sitting there and I was looking for something to do. None of my friends were around. And then I saw a buddy of mine, James Murphy, killing drummer, was hosting a drum clinic like, I don't know, an hour away from me, an hour north. So I was like, screw it let's go so i got my car and i go up there and i watch james murphy put on this killer clinic and then after we're catching up and just talking and the first thing he does is he introduces me to his young pupil who is jeremy gold so my first time ever meeting jeremy gold and we can get into that and then the second thing he springs up to me he's like you go to nashville a lot right and at the time i was doing the back and forth with an artist and i was like yeah and he's like do you know rich redmond I was like, no. He's like, you need to know Rich Redman. I said, okay, cool. So I get home and I Google you. And the first thing that comes up when I Google you is a picture of you wearing a shirt that I designed. Yes. I had a short stint having a, a custom t-shirt operation. And there was this shirt that said, I like girls in heels that through it some other way made its way to Los Angeles and in a store and you happen to pick it up. And the first time I ever Google you, boom, you're wearing a, a shirt that I had designed. That's called, that's what's called, I love girls in heels, or I like girls in heels. And it was a big picture of high heels. I was like, this is fantastic. But how small of a world would it need to be that you being an entrepreneur, developing this clothing line, developing this shirt, somehow from a musician wearing it, it ends up at the wasteland in LA on Melrose, and I buy it. It's crazy. What are the chances? Yep. That's the, that's the it. And so that's when I reached out to you and we started talking on the phone then. And then I 
think I ran into you once at Red Door in Nashville, and then you were up here doing a clinic with James Murphy and Dave Desenzo, and I don't know, it just kept happening, and here we are. <laughs> and here we are all these years later, and that was, that was a good thing. That was, like a, that was an event at like the YMCA in Salem, Mass., which is yep. like, yes, that's Salem, right? The Stephen King, Salem's Lot, Salem's Mass, I believe. Isn't yeah, it? I mean, I don't know. I haven't read enough Stephen King to know. I know he's a big New England guy in Maine and whatnot. But yeah, Salem, Salem Witch Museum, the whole, uh, I know that the, what's it called? The Satan, Satan Church is there. Yes. It's a very uh, witchy town if you're a yes. Halloween lover. And so I didn't know what I was getting thrown into. You know, someone says, hey, do you want to play your drums in front of a group of people and maybe say a couple words of wisdom, be a fundraiser? I'm like, yeah, sign me up. And I'm there with Desenso, who was just a monster. I mean, both these guys, James Murphy playing in the, the Blue Man Group in Boston. Yep. And they were just shredding. They played like, I think they played 32 notes for every one of mine. Yeah, it was, it was, but you guys were a great, especially as far as personalities and diverse playing, were a great mix. It was awesome. It was fun. It was fun. And then we kept in touch over the years and you kept coming to Nashville. Um, I mean, you're kind of a New England kid through and through. Yep. And you would be coming to Nashville because you were like, I'm going to try to crack this nut. I'm going to play with these recording artists. That, and then you were doing business there. And you always had this kind of mindset of a, the businessman drummer. Yeah. Since day, since day one, that was like a definite thing. Like, I started to learn everything to play drums more, right? So being in high school, it was like, oh, you want to be able to play shows? You need to know how to book the show. So I learned how to do that, right? Oh, you, you need money to keep this thing going? All right, so how does this work? Oh, merchandising, ticket sales. So I learned that. Um, and then as I got older, like I started to tour in my late teens. And that was, this was like during the MySpace era. And we started to go out on like college runs right. and I was part of the team that was running the MySpace for the band, selling the tickets for the off dates, uh, selling the merch online, do, building the whole thing. And that's like where I got my business chops was really just from like, okay, if I do these things, it allows me to play drums more. That was the equation. So have the, have some sort of a other passion or, or skill set be bringing in the money which would afford you the ability to play drums and to play with whoever you want no matter what it paid yes that's definitely where it got and there was like a to take it to make a long story short it went from you know doing the bits of touring recording and then building up a teaching career and saying okay because that was goal one is like can i make a good living just with drums period and i got to that i just didn't have any days off and so that i was like hmm where is this going to lead? And sort of in the music space, I started to do a little bit of consulting. But then, oddly enough, a drummer friend of mine said, hey, I, I really need to introduce you to this guy, Brett Sarkowski. And at the time, Brett was at the Game Show Network running their uh, mobile app division. And he was running their like research and development thing. And I met with Brett for 20 minutes. And he was like, do you want to consult for Game Show Network? And I was like, Sure. I've never done this before. Like in this place, like, no, you're creative. You'll be fine. I was like, cool. And that was like my start into that. And then when I saw what I could make money wise for that, that's when that other thing shifted where it was like, hold on, if I can build another vertical of revenue and just make sure I'm working for myself, I can play drums for whoever I want. I, I'm in control of the drum path at that point. Yeah. This is something that always reminds me of our buddy, Nick Graffini with the drummer's resource. who's always, you know, talking to his guests about, Hey, so is it, should we feel guilty if we have to work a day job? Should we feel guilty if we have other instruments, you know, interests outside of drumming, which comes up a lot. It's that guilt factor. And this is something that I'm sure Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy voiceovers.com has a lot of thoughts and feelings on because, you know, Jim started as a drummer, still has drums, still plays drums. And um, it's got a bunch of my gear that I gave him over at the house there that he's just playing hot for teacher on. He probably just <laughs> so sweaty because he probably just finished the intro to hot for teacher. But Jim created all these other verticals and revenue streams and stuff. So Jim, yes. that's pretty an interesting thing, right? That, and, and with Jimmy being involved in all these things, he's always been kind of like my Yoda and my muse always give me advice about how to handle business and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And he, yeah. I There's figured a lot you'd of be interested by that. 
there's there's um silo congruency in what you're doing if that makes sense you have yes you know, uh, uh, there's always like a creative uh, part of you being engaged in order to keep uh, the motor running for the drumming, it sounds like. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, a- absolutely. And that's the thing. And I like that you guys brought up the narrative piece. I think we need to consciously change the narrative because I think so many people coming up, they don't know what the new lifestyle is, if that makes mm-hmm. any sense. And I feel like not only do we need to change the narrative, we need to glorify the new narrative and celebrify that because I feel people will be 10 times happier and they'll get to do more cool stuff. Like if you think about, you know, like a a, a Jared Leto or a Pharrell, any of these guys, right? They're all pluralist already, right? And you don't think about it like, oh, you're not like, oh man, I wonder if Jared feels guilty from the nights he's on stage with 30 Seconds to Mars versus when he's on a film set versus when he's working with a tech startup right? He's just a thing and you think it's cool. I think that's where it has to go for drummers. One, there, there's so much more value. Like there's so, there's already drummers doing like, I always think of like Chris Kimmer owns the brown owl, right? Has his hand in real estate, like just crushes things. And it's like, that's what makes oh, and his passion for hockey and, and the things he has going on in that vertical as well. Like that's what makes it, it's Chris, like that's the amazingness. And, and yes, does he, play drums and crush it and it's the same with you guys right it's it's how do we better tell that story so it's not like oh i'm a drummer but i also do this it, it needs to be the collective uh narrative yes yeah, so you're no, saying I, that I, ultimately, I love that. Yeah, ultimately the um the market i mean it's it's a matter of confusion of the market is what you're kind of talking about which is something that i've always battled with since my uh getting into self-entrepreneurship and self-employment uh, you know, a lot of my background is voiceover and video and, and radio and things of that nature, podcasts. But at the same time, I am a partner and own an electrical lighting, you know, trade conglomerate that's starting to develop. If oh, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. So it's a lot of people, wait a minute, I'm, you do all this and you, how does this kind of come in? I know, I get it. It's confusing. Yeah. I mean, but Jimmy and I talk about Yeah. yeah. I mean, Jimmy and I talk about it all the time, like, how do we take all these things that define you as a creative being and, a, you know, you're, Jimmy, you're the perfect example of a guy where, you know, um, art and commerce are constantly meeting. So for, for the, um, the neophytes out there, the folks that don't know about consulting are interested in that, what does that entail? What does that mean, consulting? Oh, it's a great question. So consulting can be a little bit ambiguous and it's how you define your services for yourself. Uh, when it comes to me, it, it, it sort of depends on what it is. It could be on anything from, you know, building in an audience or following on social media. It could be also consulting on building out content for social media or business development or creating the right partnerships. Uh, so it really depends. I even do things like uh, think tanks where it's like a company will hire me to come in and do three meetings that are about an hour to two hours long, present a whole deck on everything on where they need help and then give them all that information and then offer them the support. But then you're sort of out. They just want you for that one brain dump, if you will, and then to move it forward. Um, But it can kind of be anything. And and that's what makes it beautiful. And if you get known for, you know, two or three services under your consulting umbrella, that's where you'll build some consistent revenue for sure. Yeah. So for the listeners and the viewers, can you list out um, us like these silos that you have and what is like, what are you currently working on? And then I know there's a lot of victories that you can celebrate here publicly. A couple of which you've dragged me along with you during the process, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So one complete vertical for me is a consulting company. That's been a blast where, you know, I've consulted for, like we were saying earlier, the game show network, uh, specifically on their mobile apps. Nice. And then even like in the uh, instrument manufacturers. So there's KHS that has a whole suite of brands. Uh, I've done some work with them and continue to do so. And I'm just trying to think, oh, um, there's a great company, Overtone, that was recently acquired by Unity that's in the video game space. Um, worked with them for two years on, on their product and had a bunch of fun there. So consulting is, is one main vertical. Uh, have a tech startup called Lesson Squad that Rich is 
obviously involved in. And that's been, I mean, as the whole COVID thing happened, that really started to take off and it, it was timed just by accident with like a release of the new part of our platform. And so that has gained a, a ton of traction there. Yeah. And then sort of the, the other thing that comes into play is working with uh, TV and film. So I have an animated series, Benny Beats, that's in development with Studio 71. Uh, we have a great writer involved in the project, Tab Murphy. And so we're just seeing where that lands. And I've been out doing those pitch meetings, seeing where Benny's home will be. Um, and then also have an agreement with a company called Litton Entertainment to do a Saturday morning network show called That's Drumming Up Dreams. Or I should say working title, Drumming Up Dreams. So really got into that, that space. I met a great guy. Uh, his name is Larry Adam. And he's part of what's called Reverb Advisor. So I signed with them to do from here forward any of my uh, – entrepreneurship endeavors or TV and film endeavors is collaboration with, in collaboration with them. So that's nice. The, the that thing. Is, that, that's something to keep you busy. And you're thinking like, okay, you were thinking in drumming, you didn't have a day off. Cause I remember like if you do two church services on a Sunday and then your, your circuit band plays 30, fr Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then you do a church service on Wednesday night. And then you might play with a big band or do commercials or teach a drum line. It's like you work in every day. Yeah. 100%. I mean, my that part of the drum career thing for me was crazy. I was up to almost 50 students a week. Yeah, that's a lot. On top of two to three gigs a week. Mm -hmm. And then I was having times when I was going out for those three, three gigs, traveling, coming home. And then I was filling any other space in between. I uh, was helping out at Desenzo's Drum Shop, where that's part of the, one of the places I was teaching and sort of where I grew up and got my foundation in this whole industry. But that, that was crazy. The, the cool thing about this, as much as it's crazy and there's a lot going on, uh, it got to a point where I could hire some folks on the consulting side and build out a team and do that. So that helped. But now, if I ever want to take three days and go play drums, or if, you know, I'm playing with buddies in New York and we're, we're doing a record, I can jump in the studio. Like, it's all there. Fly down to Nashville, do whatever, right? Like, that, those opportunities now open themselves up yeah. um, in a big way, for sure. Wow, that's a lot. And so time management has got to be crucial for you. Pre-planning, yeah. time management, all that. So are there days that you're doing everything that you have to do or is it each day you're just putting out fires? I'm assuming it's like you're dealing with the things that need to be attended to the most right then and there. Yeah, great, great question. So I went through a period of life where it was too much. It was, I called it like if I was switching gears too much, my brain couldn't handle it. And that included if there was like traveling involved too and trying to go from consulting brain to creative player brain. <laughs> like that's where I'd get honestly somewhat messed up depending. Um, and then everything shifted. So now I run like a crazy morning routine uh, that involves a bunch of other things like waking up, getting hydrated, cold shower, journaling, exercise. And then by 10 o'clock I have my – uh, first meeting of the day or my first meeting that's always on the books with uh, my co-founder at Lesson Squad, Josh Hoffmanson. Josh. And so that's the first thing, at least as where I'm at today, that's where we're at. So it's like, boom, Lesson Squad. And it's like, what do we need to do? We're, you know, we're checking what are the, the items? Are there any fires to put out is always question one. Um, so that's part of it. And then when it comes to consulting clients, that stuff is always scheduled throughout so i know i could be like a couple hours that day or it could be that i'm checking in with two guys who are working on a client that i'm overseeing right. so yeah everything like i run by the calendar of my phone it's like crazy it's it's everything you're you're, Mar you're martha stewart madonna scheduled i mean you are yeah. every like 15 minute increments so uh morning ritual cold shower jim thoughts i was wondering if you needed a voiceover guy for his shows Always. Do you? Or we should talk about this stuff. No, because that's the thing. I'm, I'm, well, let's get on to the, the IP conversation because I think that's some, I have some thoughts that I would love to get. Well, more or less, I actually have questions that I want to get your guys' thoughts on when it comes to Well, this, this is, you know, I mean, just, just say, let's just take one of your offerings. The idea that you could take the idea of being a drummer. You know, I fancy myself a drum educator. You're a drum educator. You took that idea. You took it. You took an idea. You executed on it. You got it picked up. Benny Beats. 
is this great animated character. And if people follow you on Instagram, they could probably go back and see some like posts and stuff. Oh, yeah. Are you just Jimmy, Jimmy Pemberton on yeah. Instagram? So at Jimmy Pemberton. And you've never been shy about throwing opportunities and creating opportunities for your friends. You're like, Rich, you're Steve the snare drum. Can right. you please voice Steve the snare drum? And so I would send in you a read for Steve the snare drum. And then you had me consulting for Lesson Squad. I mean, these are great, great things where you're, you're just not afraid to, to spread the wealth. You and I, we even had a three... A uh, person company for a while called GPR Creative. Yep. And we managed some music acts. We learned a lot. And yeah. our partner, Jeremy Gold, got really big and famous. You got big and famous. No, he, he couldn't handle it. No, no, that's a, I, I, I like how you point out. No, because that's the big thing. I call this like entourage effect. I grew up on that HBO show, Entourage, sure. which half ruined me, but half like was like, oh, I get it. Like, take care of your people and vice versa. Like, that's, that, that's the actual fun of it. So, yeah, it's, it's the always, like, people, I hate when people say don't work with your friends. I'm like, if you don't want to work with your friends, you have the wrong friends. Yeah, and, and, and don't mix business and pleasure. I mean, that's all we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so really? I'd say flip that. You know, if, if you don't think that you want to work with the people who are your friends, get new friends. Right. And it's the same. I would mix business with pleasure all day. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm with that. Um, with the Jeremy Gold thing, like us doing that GPR thing. And this is a, a huge thing. Like we were doing that work uh, with a great artist, Lindsay Highlander. Right. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot done in a very interesting space. The big thing that I've learned about things like that, or even as different projects sort of move ahead and then you think this one's kind of going to go over the line first but then it stops and then this one goes over the line is never kill anything i think people kill things too much they go up oh, that's done i never say that's done i just say that's here for now until an opportunity comes like a g power is a great example let's say we you me and jeremy needed to reunite because some artist opportunity happened for the three of us wouldn't think twice you would just do it Right, and that's why you never completely dead something and say would never unless it was a bad experience. Yeah, but other than that, keep everything open because you just don't know. Yeah, you got a you got a lot of balls in the air, man. I mean, it's it's like a you got a scrimmage game going at all times over at your place. Yes, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I see. It's funny for me. It feels all um, everything to me. At least the way I always visualize it is it's just a line item. And I try to keep them, and I'm stealing this from a great interview that's on Complex with the founder of Spawn, uh, worth checking out if you haven't. He basically says, you know, he learned how many balls he could juggle before one fell. And I've sort of done the same thing. I know that I can have no more than four verticals yeah. going on at one time or something will be bad. So, like... I have drumming. This is how I categorize it. I have dr drumming in its thing where I always keep that going, whether I, even if I'm not doing a ton of it, it's always there. I then have the startup, obviously, Lesson Squad. And then I bucket everything that's TV and film because it's the same headspace as that piece. And then what was the fourth? Let me look at my board. Could be uh, teaching. You're not teaching right now. No, so, then, oh, consulting. There you go. Yeah. yeah, so there it is. Drumming, consulting, the startup being the uh, being lesson squad, and then TV and film. Yeah. So and, you know, talking about Benny Beats, I'm, I'm just, I just going back to that because we're both products of music education. Jim's kind of a product of, mu of music education. And our friends at School of the Rock, School of Rock Nashville, School of Rock Franklin are the sponsor of our show. We love them. Kelly and Angie McCray. Jim, aren't they the greatest? They are. They're very, uh, very good looking people. Yeah, they're a good looking couple and they've been, they've been around a long time. I got to check in with them. We've been just texting during this, this COVID madness. I think they have had to pivot like everyone else and offering, uh, you know, online things for the kids. And now I think with masks and hand sanitizer and tons of bottles of Lysol, people are back to playing music together. I got to check in with them. But if you're, if parents, you have kids out there, you want to get them involved. They're taking ballet, they're playing soccer, but you want to get them a musical instrument. They want to learn how to play the bass, the guitar, keyboards. They want to front a band. They want to play drums. 
then the, you just reach out to my friends Angie McKelly and Kreit. I'm Angie and Kelly McCrite. I yeah, what is going on today, guys? Uh, but there's two email addresses. So easy. Tell them that Jim and Jimmy and Rich sent you. And what are those, Jim? Franklin at schoolofrock.com and Nashville at schoolofrock.com. Yeah, you love it. Music education rocks. Music education works. It teaches people skills, playing in a group, uh, respecting your fellow human, time management, all those things. So we love School of Rock. School of Rock, thank you. And my brain is working faster than my mouth today. So, yeah. Jim, what comes to mind when you see Jimmy? I mean, this well, guy's got life by the you-know-what. But it's because of um, diversifying his skill set and capitalizing and um, identifying the areas that he can monetize it, understanding that, you know, we're probably not in a world where you can monetize and be like mega successful at one thing anymore, like you were talking about earlier, that people need to be okay with this multipreneur uh, aspect of life. Um, yeah. That I can really appreciate that because that's one of the things I preach to voiceover people and I consult with a lot of different voiceover students and stuff like that. All they want to do is get in front of a mic and read. I'm like, well, you, you should probably learn how to produce your own stuff and learn how to mix your voice with music beds and, you know, produce spec spots so you can actually prospect with people and do all these different things that you should learn how to do. Even, you know, then this is so contrary to the elitist voiceover people out there making your own demos. They hate that notion. But dude, I've, I've made all of my own demos up until recently and that's how I've gotten my work. And it's always yeah. been out of real stuff that I've done. Yeah. Um, but it's just, that's, that's something you have to do. And I can appreciate that aspect that there's somebody else out there that is doubling down on their skills, gifts, and talents. And just uh, figuring out different ways to juggle a lot of things in the air to see which one goes it's almost like yeah. what you used to talk about rich coming to town and playing with how many bands in one year what that you said 29 yeah. was my Ooh. record yeah Ooh. 29 bands year, and you had no scheduling conflicts but you were you understood it was like playing the lotto one of these things has got to go yep. yeah and then a couple of those things are you know 99 percent of those people have left the right. music business. They just were like, I'm going back to Des Moines, Iowa or Fargo and I'm going to work for my dad's company or whatever. Not a, not a bad thing, but it's just, just that, that gumption of that follow through and that stick to itness and pumping your chest and, you know, facing those, that rejection and falling in love with that rejection. What, what do you guys think that the world changed in a way where we have to wear so many hats? Like, because if I had, if I had, I don't know. It seems like I was playing drums at the level that I'm playing at in the 80s and 90s with Studio 54 and the coat, the velvet ropes and all that. Playing drums is, was enough back then. Being a consultant was enough back then. Being a voiceover. What changed in the world that now we have to wear so many hats and be great at all the hats? How, how did that happen? Yeah, I think it's uh, technology, right? As things right. got automated, right? Like you could look at like and it's also, it's technology mixed with an industry's failure to progress or to innovate all the way through, right? Like you look at the, the whole Napster situation, what should the industry have done, right? They should have acquired Napster, not sued it. <laughs> right? Like it's, it's that yeah. sort of thing. Or, or you even look at live streaming. Somebody in the music industry call it like a Sony, a Warner, whatever, should have been building live streaming for music, for musicians at scale, making certain deals with the labels, etc. That should not have come from where it's coming from now, like Facebook, Twitch, etc. So they lose again. Um, I think it's that type of thing for music specifically. Um, other than that, yeah, because I'm just trying to think of like the, what was the different thing there. Records. Well, so, yeah, like voiceover, right? I mean, so Jim, you know, I mean, the, the tools that you need, the, the, the tools you need to, to be allowed entrance into that field are so much more affordable now, right? Yeah, the barrier to entry has come down for sure. Yeah, yeah. And then so competition goes up, mm -hmm. right? And so then if that starts to split, that's where one person can't take all the cake. And it's amazing to see how the industry is becoming somewhat commoditized because you're going to have – your Kias, your, you know, your, your kind of entry level 
low cost talent out there and there's a ton of them. Yep. And then you have the upper talent, the elite talent that I talk about that I always manage to piss off uh, <laughs> by sharing my ideas because they don't like the, uh, the notion of having to drive down rate. But I'm like, for people that are just getting into it, they think making $20 for reading something is amazing. Yep. Last week or earlier today, they might have been at Walmart being a greeter. So $20 being made in five minutes to them is going, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And yeah. you know, you'll get the elitists that go, well you should have paid, you know, 250 to $500 for that project. And it's, well, yeah, that's all well and good because they don't, they don't know how to go negotiate yet. They don't know, they're not that good yet. Mm -hmm. And it's almost, they don't, the elitists don't realize that it's good for them because it's setting them apart even more so. Yep. That yeah, the let's face it, those, those, those people aren't necessarily going to buy that gear right. and stick with it. They might get that one opportunity that comes out of nowhere, but let's face it, we all know that there's maybe that, that initial bit of luck or a door being opened, but to stay in that room, you got to keep showing up with the goods and can be continually developing personally and professionally. Otherwise, forget it. It's just the fluke. What I don't get is that you're never going to hear about Brad Pitt being upset that Rich Redmond is trying to get into acting no matter how. Never. He's, you know, he's never going to be upset about that because he's Brad Pitt. Yeah. And he commands a certain price. That's the thing is being able to, to create yourself into a person of interest to the point where you can package and sell it. Sell it is the most operative word and yeah. be able to close deals. Yeah, no, that's it. It's been interesting too. watching in the acting space. What's wild is, you know, they're already getting to this point, but it's going to get to more of this point with live action where it's like, who is going to bring more eyeballs to the film? Is it the tried and true star? I mean, Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt's on a bit of a different level, but that will also shift as these years go on. Or is it so-and-so on YouTube that has hundreds of thousands of viewers every week or millions of viewers every week? It becomes a, a game. Like, if you look at what happened with Will Smith, he wasn't doing much until he joined Instagram and YouTube and started putting out web content. That brought him back into sort of pop culture, at least in, in my opinion, right? Like, what was his big film in that gap? There, there wasn't any. And now you're seeing him get more, but you're seeing now he's just relevant to the entire market again because of that. Um, yeah, it's... Yeah. it's so there's also one, there's so one, there's one element that he's doing that a lot of the elitist actors are not. And that is he, I, I, from what I could see, he truly engages with his audience, mm -hmm. which is very important these days. If you're an actor or celebrity and you don't engage with your audience, people are going to pick right up on that. I mean, the, yeah. the paradigm has changed. It's, yeah. yeah. Especially well, it's interesting. If on that up and up, or if they come from, from web particularly, yeah, it's the game. I mean, look at the look at look at how um, Will Smith and Ashton Kutcher, two serial entrepreneurs, highly successful people. Will Smith was a rap star. He knew Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones got him the sitcom. He didn't have any acting or comedic training. He was just a natural. It worked great. It, it moved it moved him up. Ashton Kutcher, male model, super nice guy had opportunities come to him. He got that 70s show, had no idea how to land a bing, bong, boom. He didn't know. I listened to his uh, thing on Mark Maron. It was like, he's like, I had no idea about the poetry and rhythm of sitcom acting. I learned on the job as I was making the money. And then also as he was making his money, he said, let me continually being a humble uh, student of life learned all about tech and startups and has yes. made a fortune mm -hmm. and has been able to reinvest in himself and do great things. Look at Sean Penn. I've learned that Sean Penn is responsible for the majority of the COVID tests in the United States. He bought them with his own money. Wow. And That's is giving crazy. them out. Those are those COVID tests at Dodger Stadium are because of Sean Penn. Wow. Crazy. Well, I got off subject there. But we're talking about TV and film. Jimmy, you were playing drums and acting. Let's face it. It's the same thing in a movie. <laughs> Love Weddings and Other Disasters, directed by Dennis Dugan, starring Diane Keaton. Fantastic. Tell us the story. How did this happen? Yeah, so that's cool. I, actually, I meant to look up the other day. I don't know when that's coming out. So 
saying that, I don't know what I can say and can't say, but here's what I, I know but I can say. But you were say. in this thing. You were on set. Yeah, I was set. in this thing. For, I was on set for four days. Um, it was super, super fun. I got to play drums with some really cool people that you, you'll see in the film. Uh, so that was, that was a big thing. But overall for me, I just answered a, an email from a casting office here. And I happened to, I was like, hey, yeah, and I just sent in, you know, my bio and whatever. And then they called and they said, yep, you've, you've been approved for it. You need to be available these days, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And then I showed up and did it. And the first day on set, uh, we're shooting this. Oh, no, this is the second day on set. Second day on set. Actually, let me tell you about the first day on set. Tell so, me, yeah. <laughs> I sat in holding for like six hours doing nothing. And like, that was like, I called a, a, another actor buddy of mine and I said, hey man, he's like, just go, you never know how it's gonna be, go, go see. And so I get there and I literally just sat there and then they just had me at the very end of the day after sitting and holding on the, all day, just like you would on a gig, take drums out of a van and walk them into a venue. Oh my God, I did that in the last music video I filmed for that band, The Fell. It was like, okay, this is where we're gonna unload the van. I'm like, oh yep. my God, I can do that, okay. Yep, no, that's exactly it. And then the other days on set, we're all playing scenes and I get there and you don't know because props is bringing in the kit. So you don't know what you're showing up with. I brought a pair of sticks just in case. And yeah, you just kind of get up there and they didn't send me any of the music prior. So you're hearing, yeah, they're like, cue music. And I'm like, anyone like, and- Does anybody know who, what this track is? Can I run exactly. it on a chart? And then the guy who was sort of the MD on set, he then came over and was like, did no one send you guys the music? And we're like, nope. And so we just did it and it was, it was great. It totally worked out. And oddly enough, him and I were talking and he's like, oh, do you know who played drums on this? And it was Chris Kimmer. That but, small world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, Chris, so I spent the, the next sort of, they were like on and off days. And it was one of those crazy times where I was doing too much of this switching gears. I was getting on a set at like 5 or 6 a.m. and sometimes earlier. And then I would leave set after doing a full day or more. And then I was going to New York for meetings, for other TV stuff. And so it was just like craziness. Um, but it was, it was all good stuff and it was super fun. And again, I got to, I'm excited for the film to come out just cause I got to, uh, perform with some really cool people that you would know, uh, some, some, some relevant, relevant names and whatnot. But for me, the benefit beyond, you know, getting, getting paid to play drums in a film and do that and kind of check that box was just more watching a film get made. Yeah. Now, was, wasn't was there some other opportunities that happened before that, too, where you were playing drums in films? There were some things that came up. Nothing that I got. Nothing, like, there were some things that I, that I got put in for, if you will, but it didn't happen. They were all on the West Coast. So, yeah, it just for whatever reason, that's a perfect thing. Fall in love with rejection. That is the name of the game. But, I mean, uh, if you make it fun, and this is what I'm, the message I'm getting from you, is that you wanted a, the audition process, you, it was almost like a hobby or, you know, there's something yeah, that sounds I, like fun. It, it, it was literally one of those little things where I just wanted to go check. And yeah. for me, it was more, I'm a huge lover of TV and film. And I was like, I, I have to play drums in a thing. Like, you yeah. have to. And I got super fortunate with this one where I get to perform with uh, other musicians, like with careers and whatnot. So we were, even though we're like background, we're not like the people I'm performing with are the principal actors in the film. Right. right as well so that's that was cool for me where i was like oh what an added bonus to be doing it and have that go on but just watching how they shoot things like i learned so much about like oh okay they're setting the camera there to catch this now now they're putting one behind me to catch this and we're resetting and then in video village they're watching everything for continuity like i was just like trying to if i could have had a pad in notes or if i could have had my phone on me on set I would have taken notes all day. There's the reason why the credits are so long. <laughs> yes. It's because it takes, it takes a, a city, man. It a takes small, a lot. Yeah, it really does. You, know, you guys, do you guys know the story of uh, Stephen Sharippa? You know who he is, an actor? No. He's the guy who played Bobby Bacala on The Sopranos. Mm. <clears throat> and back in the day, 
Uh, he was the entertainment director at the Riviera Casino Hotel and Casino in Vegas. And as a hobby, he would go out and audition for acting jobs, like on his lunch break. So look how that panned out. I think he landed wow. his first film in the Flintstones movie, one of the Flintstones movies, and it just took off from there. Awesome. And, you know, he, had, he had a major role in The Sopranos. So a secondary him. role, but pretty, pretty substantial. I mean, I listen, yeah. I think that's a good testament to like, don't, so many people say this is how it's done, so this is how I have to do it. <laughs> like, forget all that. And this, is, this comes down to a, a huge belief thing that I had. Never design something just to pinpoint the career you want. Design it also to the lifestyle you want. Because that could change the career or the way that the career facilitates itself for you. You know, because I but see a lot know, of guys who are like, this is what I want to do for a living. They go and they get it and they go, ooh, I love my job. But then they hate the life that it requires for them to have around it. Right. Where if they had designed a little bit more for lifestyle, then the job might have looked different or they might have negotiated something differently going into whatever the job is. So like yeah. maybe there's someone out there that they like being on a film set once a year. So that's all, the, and they, that's what they kind of keep in mind. I don't know. It's a, sort of a, a different perspective, but I like it. Deciding for lifestyle versus just a job title. That's a tweetable tweet right there. Yes. That, <laughs> that's good, Jimmy. I now, you're setting up a lifestyle for yourself that you like, and I'm assuming you, you know, you like, I mean, you're a single dude. You don't have anybody telling you what to do. You nope. got your space. You got cash in the bank. You're a creative dude. You're making money from your creativity. The thing is, is that, I don't know about any of your hobbies. I only see you working all the time, 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. What do you, now you're still working out with Ryan. I think I've seen you, we've done that workout together, right? Yeah, yeah. I wish yeah, I could go to That day, man, I am working out with you and I was like, I have been working so hard to get in that shape to do that workout. And you come in and you kill this thing. And I'm like, how? I've been doing this for months. <laughs> and you came in and crushed it. That blew me away that day. Well, it, I mean, that, that guy is good because it's a full body workout where you're doing like kicks and sparring and plyometrics and resistance training. But then you go out and you're swinging the sledgehammer on the tires and then you're moving the, the NFL thing across the concrete. I mean, yeah. that's my kind of workout. I want to, I want, if I'm going to pay, <laughs> yeah, they, what do the they call sled. it? The sled, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, which is now officially the NFL thing. It's the NFL, NFL thing. <laughs> it's so you can have tight glutes and, and hammies, man. So, <laughs> but no, we that was oh, so man. fun. I mean, my God. Did you do that every idea. day with him? Yeah. Say again? Do you do that with him every day? Uh, not every day. So I'll see him uh, at least once a week, and then the nice. other mornings are on me. But that the, going to see him for that session once a week keeps me very accountable because – if I don't do what I'm supposed to do physically the yeah. other days, then I suffer very, very much on that one day a week. Ah, that's nice. Well, you know what? You just have such a, an amazing essence and, and you're so focused and time managed and you have the spirit of positivity. A lot of people are like, you know, you got to move to Manhattan. You got to get a live like a rat. You got to move to Los Angeles, get six roommates. You've had amazing things happen to you, come to you it's in Quincy, crazy. Mass., yeah, it is the craziest thing. Yeah, I've been very, Great. very fortunate. It's literally, it is the craziest thing from all the music stuff that's happened to even like, you know, they shoot film here in the, you know, spring, summer, a little bit of fall. And I just happened to get the one drum gig for the feature film that was being shot, that needed a drummer, right? That was here. Awesome. Like weird stuff like that. And even the way I got into to the other projects like getting the animated series off the ground and in a moving in a forward direction came from i was meeting with an amazing guy chris lynch who at the time was running reverb advisors right now he's ceo of a great company at scale but i met with him to talk about um lesson squad and he was like well, what else do you have and when i showed him the animated series he's like oh a great guy named larry adam will be here in a couple of weeks i'm going to get you a meeting with him Nice. And Larry at the time was living out West, but also lived in New York. But I just got lucky where these things just seemed to 
yeah. happen. Well, it's uh, just, it's, yeah, it's that thing also where no man is an island and you definitely have these people, these true believers that have opened doors for you, you know, and, and um, keep them close, man. It's, 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 it's a great thing. It's just that thing that we, we no man is an island. You know, we need the help. We really yeah, do need that. No, help. it definitely takes like a, a t- I'd say it takes a team and time. And I feel like so many people forget about the time thing, me included. Like patience is a bitch. Like it's, oh. I've learned to be patient, but it's still like, it's the thing where you can see where the dots connect, but you don't know how that timing's going to unfold. You just have to, to keep it, I guess, keep it going forward. But yeah, I think the game's changed. I think like, for a great example is like playing drums. If you do want to play drums and tour, you are hundred percent better off moving to New York, Nashville, or LA because you, a lot of the bus call, etc. you have to physically be there. There's that. If you're playing in the digital realm, no, like you can do whatever you want. And let's say you only want that part like in my case with the drum stuff, to be a percentage of your career, though that just means I have to be in New York, Nashville, RLA a percentage of the time or have a presence there enough to make enough happen for whatever fits that lifestyle or that career that I'm looking for. Um, That's something I hope that more people know and explore, that they can do that. Um, Because I think that will become, like I always look at like Chance the Rapper and what he did out of Chicago. Right? Like, he didn't move. You know, he didn't go to one of the Meccas. He's in a secondary market and crushed it. I think you're going to see that happen. Um, And I have crazy predictions, too. I think Boston as a city is underserved in entertainment. Like, we do get the tax credit for TV and film. You got on the music side and just, like, dance, et cetera, you have Berkeley, right, which now also has the conservatory attached. You then have Harvard. And everything that comes with that, you have MIT. And then again, you have all, like, I think it's the area in the country with most schools per the square mile. So you got a whole youth market. It's like the craziest thing to me where I feel as more comes in, there's more to be done here. I really want to be a part of oh, let, Yeah, let, let's face it. Let, yeah, that's, it's, it's an epic city, you know, just culturally. So, and the fact that you're there, you're going to be in line way ahead of everybody else. And I love this conversation. And I, and I want to encourage all of our listeners and viewers to not go anywhere, but we're going to be right back. The Rich Redman Show will be right back. Well, our big tagline has been inspiring kids to rock on stage and in life. We changed it actually to inspiring the world to rock on stage and in life because when kids are here, they learn so much more than music. They learn how to be on a team. They learn responsibility. They learn to take responsibility for their actions. They learn to organize their time. And we try to teach them, you know, not to be that person that nobody wants to be on a tour bus with. (laughs) Connect with School of Rock today. Search School of Rock Franklin or Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. Jim, you had this crazy idea you were going to share with us. Yes, it's a, you and I have talked about it before, and it harkens back to um, putting Rich in situations and scenarios that he may not be familiar with, and the, the NFL thing is uh, kind of brought that back to mind. You and I, Rich, have talked before about um, doing like a series of videos of you doing things nobody would expect you to see, like uh, changing a tire. Changing or oil, changing, changing a tire, oil, uh, mowing know, my lawn. Maybe describing what is going on in a professional sport. Oh, these guys right here in the black jersey are up against these guys in the yellow jersey, and it seems like the yellow jersey guys are running one way, and the black jersey guys are running the other way. Going hunting would be hilarious, too. Be amazing. Are you like, oh, right. I have, oh, so you guys just want me to kill that innocent creature right there? That really just, <laughs> that's just drinking water by the brook? You know, and yes, this also goes back to when we did your documentary and I talked to your, um, your parents and I interviewed them for the film. And they said uh, that you were actually at a game and you were, you were you know, doing the, the, the drum line and everything. And you were so concentrated on that, they asked you who won the game. And you said, well, I don't know. I don't know. I was always so worried about getting my parrot little speed up. Yeah, that's focused. There's a testament to something about that. I love oh, that. No, I know. I would have definitely done some stuff differently in my youth. 
I just think um, that there is an opportunity there for, for you to do things that people would never expect to see you do. And I think it would that's be a great idea, Jim. Very entertaining and hilarious. I, I agree. And I would love to add something that just came in my mind, Jim, as you were saying that amongst that brilliant idea, what I would pay to watch you do to be a date commentator. A gate oh, so commentator? like no, just no, watch date. people on their dates? So two people go on a date and you're on another table with a microphone and you're telling the audience what you think is happening <laughs> on the date. Oh my God. Oh, her funny. hand is on his upper thigh. Exactly. Yeah. That would like, be pretty funny. From even how the guy shows up. Oh, it's coming in. Looking clean. Looking clean. She's coming in. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Underdressed, overdressed. Like, it would just be hilarious. Yeah. Shirt you know, looks a little wrinkled. Yeah. She doesn't care that much about this one. This could be the friend zone. <laughs> <He's>, uh, <laughs> oh my God. That's a great He's wearing comfortable idea. shoes and zip ups. No, I don't think so. Now this could be another whole dating. Dating shows are popular. Uh huh. But picture having somebody watch it and then the, the crowd at the same point is going to watch and they'll, do they agree with you? Do they disagree? And then at the end, you put the two people who are on the date in separate things and interview them. And then you see how your commentating worked out because you're reading their body language or maybe, maybe you can hear them too, Mike. I don't know. There's a, we can go a lot of ways with this, but I think you would crush it. Oh my God. That sounds like a great offering. I think that would be hilarious. I think that, yeah, you should probably, we should pursue that and drumming roulette. Well, Jimmy has <laughs> got, Jimmy's got like a million people to pitch these show ideas to. And he would end up being a producer like Rob Deerdeck. Here's, a, here's another idea. We've, I don't know if we've ever brought this idea up on the show before, but I have had this idea before where you get some that, you know, heavy hitter drummers, and it could be any, any instrument, I guess, but for drummers, uh, and this could be a nice little video series. Somebody coming to Nashville, all right, they get in front of their, um, their peers and, you know, these heavy hitters like Rich, maybe, you know, Kevin Murphy and Ben Caesar and uh, Chris McHugh and all these other guys. And they sit down at a set of drums, only knowing the people, and, and it's drumming roulette. They have to play four songs. They have no idea what the songs are. Right? Yeah. That's and they have to melt question. their way through them. And it's based on interview questions. So, you know, it's not like you're going to throw a complete, you know, curveball at them. It's, it's based on, you know, what music did you listen to? Would you like playing growing up? Because I always said that I could sit down and I could play Carry On Wayward Son. I could play a whole host of songs because that's what I used to do. I still have the muscle memory, you know. I don't know. I think there's something there. I agree. I think there's definitely something there. There's definitely like a certain niche web show thing that could happen there and th now too as that is becoming more and more a thing where it's yes. like you know niches are what win so it's like if that's something you can take it and take it to like let's say like a drumio or a drum channel and then you you created this other this expanded offering for them beyond education or interviews it's that's interesting it's yeah. valuable it'd be, it'd be really funny and then even the entertainment and the education part of it comes in with the uh, reactions from the judges. Yep. You know, here's what you could have done better, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, and then, you know, there's, there'll be those iconic moments when a song comes up and one of the judges played the song, like, is the originator of the song. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. Like, imagine having to do, like, a police tune in front of Stuart Copeland or something. <laughs> that, would, that, would, that would be, yeah, rough. Which I'm sure, like, like Josh Freese obviously has. Yeah. But, you know, those situations, are playing an Al Dean tune in front of you, no thanks. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Like, it's like, there's something about doing it in front of the guy that did it. That's, uh, I've done that once. What was that, Jim? I played uh, Hicktown in front of you. Oh, no, it was great. We have it in video in somewhere. Anybody right. can play my stuff. It's just you can't make all the faces and twirl the six at the same time. That's part of that's, that's it. So ridiculous. So Your stuff can be difficult, dude. Let me tell you something. Don't don't kid yeah, yourself. Let me tell you. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. So Jimmy, going back with the um, this Harvard incubation program and launching Lesson Squad and then all the cool things that have come from Lesson Squad, take us down that that trip from just coming up with the concept of what it is to getting it to where it is now. Sure. Yeah. So concept is relatively, I don't know, four years old. So this is a great example. This is going to run into the whole like sitting on things. I was teaching and I was having a lot more luck teaching than some of my peers because I was at the time, things like Twitter 
we're, we, Twitter had just sort of started to take, um, and this is sort of pre-Instagram, and I was able to build a crazy teaching roster to the point where I was giving students to other teachers. And then it started to hit me. I was like, wait a minute. I know how to use these digital tools from playing in bands and being on the road and, 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 and figuring things out. But there's all these other educators that didn't go that road and don't know how to use these tools. So I was like, what if we could make the tools for them? And so that was kind of the first idea that I jotted down. And then my next step was to do a proof of concept completely non-digital. So I literally had other teachers. I was giving them students and they were putting a percentage in my mailbox, like literally dropping off an envelope of cash to me because I helped fill their roster. And I was like, okay, here's what we've learned. We learned that if we give the teacher students and they don't have to handle X amount of the work, they will pay for that convenience. So that was cool. And I happened to be, uh, I was consulting at the time for um, a venture-backed startup called Cosmo, that Josh Hoffmanson, who's co-founder at Lesson Squad, was the yeah. founder of that company. And I was telling him what I had been doing, and he was like, do you want help? Do you want help making that digital? I was like, yes, I do. So then we did the first V1, and we launched that. We put some teachers on there, and then we started testing. And at that point, um, Josh had taken a break from the startup and had started going to Harvard Business School. So then since he was at HBS, he applied for us to be in the Harvard Innovation Labs Venture Incubation nice. Program. And so that's how we got in there, which was amazing. Like I don't have a college degree. So for me to be able to kind of roll on to the Harvard campus and, and check things out and just sort of be in that community and see how it thinks and operates was amazing. I was so impressed, which I, I, I wouldn't say expected to be, but just, just by the culture that they had, at least from what I was exposed to, absolutely amazing the way that you know in the program we were in other companies rooting for each other the way that they so openly networked um was really really great and we basically took you know we we got into it two separate times and so we took two years and basically the whole time josh was in grad school and we tested everything with lesson squad from lessons to then, okay, can we add this piece of tech and expand it, you know, to be nationwide, did that. Ooh, can we add retail? And then that became a big thing. Um, and so we really did our testing and got our full foundation there. Um, but for me, that was a whole experience, just more or less learning from the culture. And then Josh was kind enough where I got to even go sit in on a class at HBS, yeah. which was a whole experience where they give you the case to say, hey, if you're going to come to the class, here's the case and you have to read the, the case and then go in and participate. And that was, uh, that was super cool. But yeah, those two years were crucial because it allowed us to make all the mistakes that you have to make when building a company. Right. You have to try everything. And then thankfully it netted out to where we had things when we really launched the whole foundation. Everyone in the industry, as we started showing to all these instrument manufacturers and major retailers, there wasn't anything to really poke holes in. It was like, wow, it's a really great foundation. Let's start working together. Uh, right. We even made this rule. Any manufacturer that we would show it to, that we'd show Lesson Squad to, we would never try to sell anything. They had to ask, how can I use this? Right. Because that's how we would, that would validate that we have something worth using. And you got the uh, emotional attachment then. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so that's where we're at. And I mean, we're still an early stage company and, figuring that out but man the last like 10 weeks have been a, a roller coaster in growth but also like the, the occasional dumpster fire like oh the tracking link for this retailer isn't working this happened here oh you just had 50 new people sign up in the last hour like make there's just all this different stuff that you're always thinking about yeah um and that, that's also the fun of it it's the fun of the ride but yeah the yeah. harvard Innovation Lab and their venture incubation program, crucial. And if I could tell anybody who's starting a company, just to, you know, this is a common saying, fail fast. It's the truest thing. Go make all the mistakes you can and try everything as early as possible. Because at that point, it will be the most inexpensive. And you can just take that knowledge. You'll get quicker to your, your actual product. Wow. I had to keep in mind, especially with the big dot side of things, uh, the other company that I'm a part of, in the beginning, we would hit stuff that would just make 
I would feel embarrassed. Like, you know, I can't believe that this is, uh, this is going to make us look bad kind of thing. And that's going to happen over and over again. You don't realize that in the beginning until it happens over and over again. Great and, point. Man. And once you realize that, dude, even Amazon screws up and makes themselves look bad. It's yep. okay. Yep. You know, it's, yeah, it's literally you part of it. Yeah. I'm super glad you brought that up. Yeah. There were definitely times where, cause I'd been, you know, on the retail side, at least in the industry since I was like 16, 17, working at a drum shop and figuring things out. So I had all these relationships from when I was a kid, like I was going to NAMM at 17, 18 years old. And so I, that's when I started to meet these people. And for the first time, the, the industry and some of these long friendships I've had, even like calling Rich to advise, like, you never want to look bad or, or risk a relationship on it. So I have this extra tension thing where I'd be calling my co-founder, Josh, but Josh, is it almost done? Or is this fixed yet? Like, we can't have it like this. Like, cause my heart's going like this. And he's like, why do you like, well, he didn't ask it this way. I'm more acid to myself and he soothed me very nicely as the co-founder that he is. I'm freaking out. And he's asking probably, what's going on. I'm like, well, I've had these relationships since I was a teenager and this is the first time that like I'm putting this certain level of risk out there, yeah. right? Where it's like, oh man. Um, but yeah, so exactly what you're saying, you are going to look bad at times. Yeah. You know? But you, I, I don't think you'll ever look bad as you think you actually do unless it's something catastrophic. Yeah. That sensitivity is important though. You know? mm -hmm. Oh, agreed. Yeah. Agreed. So yeah, yeah. so you know what, since you said that, which I love, I would say be that sensitive about it because it's how you're going to make the better product and the better decision. Um, just emotionally, it might suck a little more. Right. Well, <laughs> and so I, I think it's an amazing offering and, and the site is live and it's, you can use it, lessonsquad.com. You can use it if you're a, a, a person or a parent that wants to get lessons for any instrument. You could find an instructor and if you're a teacher, it's a great way to have your schedule filled, find more students, the e-commerce and all that stuff is handled through the site. And not only that, um, say you look up my profile on LessonSquad.com, you're going to see a list and a picture and a quote about every product that I use and recommend. And yeah. so if you're a teacher and you have your little lesson store, Jim can teach lessons on Lesson Squad. He can recommend the Rich Redmond drumsticks, the Black Sheep Beater, Fundamentals of Drumming for Kids, all these products that he uses, and he might make a little taste from, the, from yep. purchasing that product. This is brilliant. Yep, exactly. We literally took the old brick and mortar model, which was lessons in the back, retail in the front, and put it in the power of the end user. And that was the big thing. It was how do we make the day-to-day -day musician win? Because that was, again, like I got to the point where I was teaching, gigging, had a full, I didn't, but I had no days off. And I had reached sort of the ceiling. So it's like, how do you improve life for those folks? It's like, okay, here are the digital tools. And now here's another revenue stream mm -hmm. that in my opinion, they should have been making the whole way, but now that we can help bring that to light, awesome. And then the truth of the matter too, it's then a win for the retailer because they're getting your influence on their sales, right? Which is huge. And then the other part, it's also a win for the manufacturer. When they have artist relations, we allow them to see the value of their artist relations or of their artist roster, right? So they'll see the list. They'll see how many page views an artist is getting, how many product clicks, how many sales, if they teach or not. And, and artist relations has never had that data set before. So we really look at it like we're enriching the entire industry and in helping progress it forward. How about that, Jim? That's value, man, right there. That's solving a problem, identifying a problem and solving it. Yep. Yeah. That's sales 101. Um, random question time or? Right it's, there? yeah, this is where, this where we, is where, where, um, God, I'm talking like a second grader, uh, that we would <laughs> insert the theme song for the random question of the day. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. I'm like, can you guys sing it? Yeah, it's the random question, question random, random question, question, random, random question, question of, a day. of the day. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little bit of a... I think that's the there. Them. It's like <laughs> it's my buddy Jeremy who's who composed the theme song to the show. Who's like 
cranking out this cool stuff for us. But yeah, we do a, a, several random questions of the day. Is it just one, Jim, or is it multiple? Well, we did the Fast Five with Marty Ray because we wanted to emulate what he did. But we'll, true, we'll, do, right. we'll do one, maybe two here. So okay, random great. question. Number one, Jimmy, would you rather go back to age five with everything you know now or now know everything your future self will learn? I'd rather go back to age five with everything I know as of today, or would I rather right now know everything my future self? Yeah. Uh, I would, I would, oh, it's, oh, it's an interesting one. <laughs> Hence, all right, it's a good, good question. Well Very played. appropriate. Uh, my gut reaction was to, I would love to know everything from here forward now. Um, just because I'm so excited on where things are going in, in, in even though it's a crazy time in the world, if you look at like the tech advancements and across the board for every single industry, I think it's fascinating, you know? So I would love to know where that's going because well, one, I think it would bring me a certain peace of mind. I would love to know like the healthcare industry as a whole, like, do I need the hip replaced or are you injecting me with some stem cells? I want to know, you know, like there's, there's things like that that I, I sort of think about where I'm like, all right, where does this net out? Um, and I actually got to a point in my life recently, uh, I'm 35 and I started to, I was like, oh, I can see 40. I was like, this is interesting for time to, to look at, you know, get some perspective. So thinking about it in that way, yeah, I would love to know everything that, that's ahead of me because I've already done the back stuff. But I understand if, can I go back and win because I have all this other knowledge? Yeah, but I kind of like where I got to. So if I could get the advantage going forward, that's the, the bet I would take. How about you guys? Wow. wow. Um, probably moving forward, yeah. No, yeah, you get the moving forward. It's, it's like getting a glimpse of the future. Yes. So um, a little bit more, uh, more uh, certainty and accuracy in uh, what you can make play out. Totally. What do you think? One more, Jim, just because Jimmy's such a great guest. Uh, you guys keep talking. I'll find one. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, Rich, I, I have a question for you. Yeah, man. Okay. So really for both you guys. So I guess I have two questions. So I'll start with my first one. My first one is as you've seen the industry change, what do you, what would, what do you not like that's happened? And what do you like that's happened? And apply this to you as a whole. I don't want you just to one vertical it as like you as a drummer. Think about all the things you do and you're passionate about, both of you. And so I guess think about that whole thing. So when I say the industry, you can apply it to anything. What's one thing where you're like, wow, thank God this happened. And this is awesome. It's one thing where you're like, wow, I wish this didn't happen. Or what would be the solve for it, you know? Because I think mm. that's an interesting thing because as we share – stuff back. Like I always think about what's the 16 year old today looking at, right? Like they have all these digital tools. There are going to be some great filmmakers when you see what some of these kids do on TikTok alone or YouTube, right? So I just think about all those things. But so in, in your specific cases, what's something where you're like, wow, this is awesome that this happened and I wish this part didn't happen or here's how it's solved. Interesting. Jim, are you going to wrap that around sales and voiceover or, or, or? I'm thinking about it. I'm trying to figure out what that might be. What about well, for, <clears throat> for drumming, so you had, the, you, know, you had the Napsters and all the file sharing and all that kind of stuff, which was the death of the rec – I'm not saying that there's no work, but let's just say it ferociously impacted the recording industry to where – recording artists if they want to be relevant and have a fan base that will last 10 5 10 15 20 25 years they have to put the emphasis on getting in the bus and going and taking live music to the people so as a, somebody who, who is a drummer that records and tours um you don't have to put all your eggs in the recording thing it's great icing on the cake but the thing that i tell the kids to go for is like get a gig align yourself with some sort of an artist that's not afraid that wants to take the music to the people you know that worked out great then i'm with a bunch of guys that love being on the road like and love going to do that thing i love the fact that there's as many outlets and channels for people to consume content, which means it's a great time to be a writer, production, producer, actor, and which trickles over into voiceover and other creative things. And then you have Amazon, which allows guys like us 
to become authors and not have to go and be published by a Penguin Press or a Random House or, you know, we or some giant conglomerate. We could self-publish things ourselves, get our message out there. And then being a speaker for uh, Fortune 500 companies, um, you know, these things, these companies are Fortune 500 companies for a reason, and they're always going to need uh, their teams and their people to be motivated and lifted up. So I think for what the things that I do, there's probably isn't a better time in human history. I have to do all four or five of them to make it all work. Luckily, yeah. they all cross talk and they all cross pollinate. And you know, this COVID thing comes along. Every re revenue stream that you have, Jimmy, is online, yeah. which is like. What a horrible feeling to think to yourself, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to pay my mortgage. How am I going to pay my credit card bill? How am I going to feed myself or my family? And if sometimes you're only on one revenue stream, that can happen and we've watched it happen. Yep. It's terrifying. Yes, agreed. You know, Jim, I don't know if you feel a little bit of that same kind of along those lines or... No, I, I think everything that I'm, in, I'm where I am in my life right now is because it's actually I, I've benefited from everything that's happened. So I'm not really regretful yeah. of, or wishing something not to have happened mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> because everything's been, you know, I can like what you're talking about. Everything I could do is pretty much online. <clears throat> the whole COVID thing actually steered more business my way because more and more people now want to do podcasts and I can produce them. I can help them. I can coach them. So while they're pulling all their advertising budgets from traditional media and things of that nature, they're now realizing, well, Hey, I can have control over all of my messaging, put it out to my audience and they'll resonate it or not, not resonate with it. Just depends on how it's put it out there. So it's been beneficial for me, especially over the past three months. I mean, nice. I thought when COVID hit, it was one of those things where I was like, you know, crap, you know, I've been building this thing for the past four years. Now it's going to hit a stone wall. No, man. I mean, knock on wood. Right. It's been, it's yeah. been great. Um, Jim's like COVID. Uh, I haven't come out of my closet. What are you talking <laughs> about? So if you guys aren't watching the episode, Jim broadcast from Literally, his closet in suburban Spring Hill, Tennessee, Jim McCarthy voiceovers, it's all black, it's all red, and right. he's all insulated and just cranking out voiceovers all day long. Awesome. Pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. So, Jim, do we have one more random question, or what do you think? Um, if not, Jimmy, what are your socials? Is it just at Jimmy Pemberton everywhere? Yep, everything's at Jimmy Pemberton, whether it's, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok. Now, what, now are you, do you have a Pemberton.com? I don't. I mean, I, I own it. Yeah. Um, I currently don't, don't use it. If you're going to check out a .com, I would encourage anyone out there just to check out LessonSquad.com. Nice. nice. Yeah. And I need to promote that because I'm, I, if you guys want to get me from lessons, I teach on Lesson Squad. Yeah, it's huge. Or just to see, even just the gear recommend, recommendations, I feel are huge. Right. It's one of those things where if you're looking for something and you want to know, you know, what do you use on the road or what do you recommend for a beginner? They can now go through and read the quotes and have an understanding of, of what you actually recommend. Yeah. Here's an interesting question based on your answer of the last question. Would you rather be able to see 10 minutes into your own future mm -hmm. or 10 minutes into the future of anyone but yourself? Oh. <laughs> I'm going to go with anyone but yourself. I would go with that. Yeah, wow. I mean, just 10 minutes? I mean, just that's not very interesting. Think about the relationships you could make if you knew other people's future 10 minutes. If you knew other people's future 10 minutes. Let's say, okay, let's say you run into Steven Spielberg, Rich, and you want right. an introduction. You see his future 10 minutes. Maybe you know exactly what he's going to order at Starbucks. Yeah, you know, you you're a conversation starter. You got something. Yeah, you right. make a very interesting argument there. I'm trying to think of like, hey, here's the question though. If I see mine, can I change it? Because like, what if I get nailed by a truck? That's bad. Yeah, that's but if I could use the 10 minutes to save myself, <laughs> that's awesome. Now that's a feature film right there. That, you know, that whole time bending thing. And what would you do? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, remember when that kid in, in uh, Steven, um, 
Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. The little kid went. He went across the road, and the eighteen wheeler came barreling through. Oh, yes. horrific! I've never seen that movie. Me neither. Oh, well, I think I might have. I might have just been really like. Might have been in my youth. No, I was definitely okay. So, Jimmy, this is what the crazy thing is: is that when Al Dean started to pop yep. fifteen years ago, you were twenty. Yes. That's crazy. That's how I feel now talking to some of these kids who are out there killing it, where I'm like, man, I'm 35, and I I meet someone that's – I mean, even Jeremy Gold is like 26. So it's like I'm dealing with it all the time. I'm like, dang. But, yeah, the whole age thing is fascinating, especially within the entertainment industry as far as, like, the way that careers can go. I've learned this. Like, the more you look at anyone's career, like, just get ready to ride the wave and enjoy the high as much as the low. Because it's the same thing, right? You're just in it. Um, and I do like, and this is where, I wonder if music will change to a degree with this, where you can have like these secondary careers that also do other things later. You know, like, what's his name? Like, the guy, is it Michael Strahan? Football player, TV host. One right? Yeah. It, or you even see there's the guy, he's in the show, um, You. He's the main character, but he yeah. was when he was younger. He was on that other show, uh, show Gossip Girl, with like Blake Lively, and then at least to my knowledge, didn't do a whole lot or a lot that at least was relevant that I knew of. And then boom, another hit show. Like yo, just ride it. Like sometimes mm-hmm. that's the game. Just enjoy it, and it's like so interesting that Jim, you didn't go to college, right? I uh, partially two years. And then, Jimmy, you were just like, I'm working at the drum shop. I'm going to be a rock star. So I went to Berkeley for two weeks, and then that's when I got my – well, one, I'll say this. When I, when I first went, I wasn't really ready to study. I'll say that. I learned that sort of day one when I walked in. So um, were you still in kind of like party mode in life um, or what? No, it wasn't necessarily the party mode. It was that I had – gotten so in love with already being in a band like i was already actively playing and so that was like a thing where i was like no no but i'm playing decent sized audiences now like and i was making a little bit of money and then what got me to go is i got an audition for a band that was doing the whole uh college circuit and i was like well i could either go to college or i could be college age playing all the colleges that's so smart yeah yeah, that was the move. And it was a band, too. The guys in the band at the time, I was, like, 19 when I got that gig. And they were all, like, 27, 28. So I was, like, this young guy behind the drums. They already had experience. So I just learned a ton yeah. from them. And that was just, you know, that was worth it. And then once I received that thing in the mail that said I owed X amount of money and that was on me, I was like, well, that's decided. We are never yeah. going back. Yeah, exactly. Well, man, you did good. And I tell you, we can, I know Jim feels the same way. We can sit here and just have hours of conversations about all the music meeting the crossroads of entrepreneurialism. And yes. I'm so happy for you with the, the cartoons and the TVs and the consulting. And thank you for dragging me along. Everybody check out LessonSquad.com. It's a game changer. It is changing the world of music education as we speak. Thank you guys, uh, both of you guys, so much for being here. School of Rock for being our sponsor. Jim, any parting uh, with gems of wisdom? It just goes to show you that if you're willing to understand the work it takes to be put in, you can make it happen. Yeah, and Jimmy does. And I, I'm not sure if a lot of people understand that. And it's kind of sad to figure out, you know, you look at what happened in the past four months, 35 million people all of a sudden losing their jobs, right? Something like that. And they're all just, I just need to find another job. I mean, I, there's many people in my life that are just, they, everything's dried up and I'm going, figure something out. You know, yeah, figure is there out some your, other thing that you do and right. you're like, you have a natural talent towards that you could just kind of pivot just a little. Right. Just make a little bit of money to, to you know, make your next mortgage payment, that kind of thing. Yeah. But there's so many people just, well, I'm just, I'm just going to go out and interview for jobs. Screw that, man. Just go on and figure something out. Make it, make it happen. Come on. Yeah, I, I have a sentence I love for that, and it's learn to create, not to take. Mm. Right? You take a job because someone has to give it to you. you. You take this. If you create it, it's yours. So learn, and that's the thing that I feel like some people, especially in the bigger conversations, they're not using their brain to create something. They're, they're just like, oh, I'm going to go 
take a job, take a job interview, whatever. That's how they're thinking, right? They're not thinking of how do I create it. I deal with this a lot. Like if a buddy calls me and he's like, I just lost my job. What do I do? And he's like, I'm looking at my finances and I'm taking away all of this. Like I'm, I'm doing that. I go, no, no, no. Ask yourselves, how do you create a little bit of income? And it's like, you don't need to cover your whole salary. How do you create, and I, I usually stuff, I go, how can you create $500 a month? And then we'll yeah. brainstorm on it. And people are, when they turn that shit on, that's when the ideas go. It's creating, overtaking all day. You mean, we need to create a course around that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, how to dig deep into somebody's psyche to, you know, shift their mindset to that kind of, because I mean, how many people that I run into that they're, they just don't know how, I just don't know how to do it. You know, it's like creating your, create your future now. <laughs> exactly. you create your, be your own island. Be, you know, create your opportunities. Hang yep. a shingle. Talk about, I, I belong to a networking group. You know how many people I invite to that that have been out of a job that I say, hey, just come by. It's, it's mainly for business people and salespeople, but people that need jobs have shown up before and you never know who you'll meet, yep. who may know somebody or may need you. And how many of them don't even bother to show up? It's free. Yeah. It just takes a little bit of effort in getting up earlier. It, it yep. meets at 7.15 to 9 every Wednesday. And I'm going. Now, Jim, are you talking about me? Because I haven't no, made it yet. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Not in that <laughs> I'm talking about people who have recently lost their jobs. I said, hey, come on out and, you know, tell everybody what you do. You never know who may know. I would, some. yeah. I'd be there with 12 face masks on. It'd be great. I'd have like uh, <laughs> rubber gloves and, and, and little meeting cards. Virtually, so. Yeah, we meet virtually. That's true. Jimmy, man, I'm a huge fan of you, buddy. And I hope that all of our listeners take the lead and they look you up, man, because you are changing the world. And it's just been amazing to be in your solar system the last decade, man. Thanks, man. And likewise, thanks for all your energy, man. It's, it's, it's huge. And watching your work ethic is what inspired me to, to keep it because there's not a lot of guys out there that keep the fire burning like you do. And it's still, it's insane. It's wild. I'm sure Jim can attest to, to witnessing the same. Um, so yeah, so thank you. And, and Jim, thank you for having me, man. And it's awesome to, to be learning about you and everything you're doing and excited to, to chat more. Like oh, this was a wonderful conversation. Learned so much. Had a great time. Uh, to all you listeners and viewers, thank you so much. Leave us a five-star rating. Tell all your friends. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. We love it. We'll see you next time for sure. Jim, thanks for your time and talent, man. Absolutely. Thank you. Jimmy, we love you, man. Keep in awesome. touch. See you soon. Thanks, everyone. See you. See you next time, everyone. This has been The Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, comment, and follow us at richredman.com forward slash listen.